I read a, a statement on that uh, in one of the uh, commentaries where they said, a man covered in bronze can go rampant any moment, take a gun and shoot and kill a lot of people. And when I read that, I realized that's the spirit that we're up to in the world. People come into the streets, go rampant, kill a lot of people, and then they... That's, 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 the, that's a judgmental spirit. And on the CD, um, you will hear how we address that problem. I think it's a very short, very brief CD. I've got one here called Two, Two Wealthy Men and Jesus. On, on this CD, you will discover the New Testament Jesus, not the uh, religious one that churches try to introduce you to, the non-religious Jesus. He's a pretty challenging Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the book is still the same book that I had here the last time or uh, that I'm traveling with for the last year or two. Um, that'll help you tremendously. I spoke this morning from the book of Acts. And, um, and I really feel like that uh, I want to just conclude with the book of Acts tonight or just go on with the book of Acts tonight. Um, the book of Acts is a, is a books, book that is still being written by the Holy Spirit. It's not over yet. I made a statement this morning and I said, I'm not so sure whether there's a lot of chapters being written in America. But I know there's a lot of chapters of the book of Acts being written in Eastern nations. Like Iran and the Philippines and, and other nations. And even in China. Uh, that's not because there's nothing happening in America. It's just that we do not give the Holy Spirit the, the prime seat anymore in the Western churches. Um, in the Western churches, uh, we want a quick fix. And if you really want to see a display of the Holy Spirit, you need, you need time. So, so I want to go into the book of Acts and, and just... Um, I'm going to do a little bit of a recap this morning. Otherwise, uh, many of you will not be up to date. The last thing that Jesus said before he went to heaven was in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 when he said, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit come upon you. He did not say you shall receive money, you shall receive wisdom. He could have said a lot of things, but he said power. And um, so we need, to ha we need to have a look into the book of Acts. What does this power look like? Because sometimes in your Western world, when you only local, focus locally, you get an idea that power is um, three fast songs, two slow ones, and offering a sermon of 20 minutes, that's power. That's not power. Or some churches even think when you have goosebumps, that's power. Power is much more than that. Jesus never had goosebumps in mind when he said, you shall receive power. That's not what I had in mind. Um, that, that is just a side effect. That is just your body saying, man, I, I think I've just been exposed to the supernatural when that happens. So um, when you look at the book of Acts, in, in, in the, in the, in the, in the, like the whole book of Acts, you're going to read about a lot of manifestations of the Holy Spirit, a lot of things that's happening. But... Um, I want to start with two stories that I just shared this morning, and I will do this for those that were not here this morning. Um, during the conference in Houston in February this year, um, Joshua Duong came from China, and he was one of our roundtable leaders, and he's also the person that is um, working behind the scenes on the Hong Kong conference, where I will be in July. Um, and we, we expect 10,000 people minimum. There could be 15,000 people. I, I don't know. But he's interrogated by the police every Thursday, by the Chinese police. And what, what is so amazing is in our roundtable, uh, there was a young prophet, and he came to me and he says, Pastor, um, if you're going to ask some of the leaders from other nations to speak this morning at the roundtable, can I just can I just maybe get the microphone for a minute because I think I have a word for some of them. Well, what happened is um, he J Joshua shared the previous night with my wife Naomi and said to her um, that he is interrogated by the Chinese police. And you don't stream this, do you stream this? 
That's okay. Um, he's interrogated by the Chinese police every Thursday. Um, and um, they want to throw him out of the country, and they made all kind of threats against him. Here comes a young prophet who, whom I had there, and he will be with me in Atlanta as well. And he prophesied, and he called him out. He says, the Lord shows me that you're interrogated by police. Uh, but God says, I'm going to give them dreams, and I'm going to stop it. Now, some people don't get excited about things like that, but for me, th that is major. For me, uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, op the operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is more impressive than any app on a phone or a smoke machine or great lights in the church. The mar you know, sometimes I get irritated by what some people, you know, they bombard you every week with emails and it's this conference and this breakthrough and this major thing and this major thing and nothing happens. I'm tired of that. I can only be impressed with what the Holy Spirit does. So God gave him this phenomenal word, and, and, and that just blessed me. Now, because of uh, the upper rooms, and, and that's why I want to cover the book of Acts tonight. I told you this morning that I, I have been exposed to many uh, Persian churches on the west coast of America. Do you know there's 700,000 Persian people living on the west coast of America? They don't try to come in, they're already here, 700,000. I've met martyrs, I've met people from Syrian churches, Armenian, um, uh, Iranian churches, I've ministered there. Uh, one of the leaders that were in the upper room in Potter's house and also in, in Houston is Luke Yegazar from Iran. He cannot go back to Iran, he's on the hit list. Uh, but his brother lives in London, and we are working with them to bring in many leaders into Atlanta. But uh, my friend Barney Huey, whom some of you should probably know, he's from Dallas, and he was in Houston, and he heard all these testimonies, and we all notice what's going on all over the world, and now we try to bring all these leaders into Atlanta. And that's why we really need a financial miracle. Um, and Barney Huey went to Luke Lagazar, and he said to him, Pastor Luke, we hear about all these phenomenal stories, what's happening in some of these nations. Is it really true what, what, what is happening right now in Iran? And Luke told him the story, and I will make it more brief than this morning. Uh, now, Luke is from Iran originally. His brother is, is in London. He um, works with uh, top leaders all over the world, and they send Bibles into Lebanon and uh, where Hezbollah is and some of those nations. Um, and we are trying to bring Luke Ligazar's brother from England. We try to bring him into um, into the upper room in Atlanta. And you guys that pray, you really need to pray because we need a, a, a 120000 to $150,000 to bring all the movers and the shakers of all these nations and do, uh, do an upper room with them. And I want to see what the Holy Spirit is going to say to us. Um, and um, so please, church, I need your help. But Barney Huey said to Luke, is it true? And, and this is what Luke said, and I will make it very brief. Last year, listen to this, last year, uh, they smuggled in 150 Bibles into Iran. The Bibles were printed in Farsi, which is the language of Iran. And uh, the Iranians are dreamers. They are major dreamers, and they are highly educated people. They love education. And um, so they smuggled these Bibles in, drove in a car, and the car broke down in the middle of a dirt road in the middle of nowhere. Um, and what happened is they found a man standing close to the car on the other side of the road in the dirt road with donkeys, a man in the middle of nowhere. Long story short, they can't get the car to start again. Something is wrong. 150 Bibles in the car. You cannot talk to everybody. It's a dangerous country. Uh, I mean, I spoke to some martyrs. I spoke to a pastor's wife whose husband was martyred in Iran. So I know. I, I spoke to an engineer that came out of Tehran. I spoke to a young man, 22 years old, old that will never see his parents ever again. But he had to flee. So I, I know what I'm talking about. And um, 
so they walk over to this man standing on the side of the dirt road and they say to him who are you and he says well I'm a sheriff of two little uh, towns over those hills and uh, guess what you're not going to tell a sheriff you have 150 Bibles in your car so they told the sheriff, well, our car broke down, but he stands with donkeys, and long story short, nothing works, can't get the car to start. They went back to him and I asked him, now, why is he standing on the side of the road? And he said to them, um, I had a dream that I need to wait here, uh, and um, I will receive the book from heaven here. Now, this happened last year. And... Um, so now they know he's waiting on the book from heaven. He had a dream. Can you see how real is the Holy Spirit? It's like you read the book of Acts in Iran today. And church, I'm not here to preach to you. I'm not here to show you how much I can preach. And I love to preach, but I'm not going to waste my energy to preach. I want to give you a perspective of the book of Acts and go into the book of Acts and stir you so that you can get a global perspective of what's going on. Um, and um, so they went back to the car, try to get the car to start, and of course, communicate to the other three brothers, the man is a sheriff, he's waiting on the book from heaven. Shall we or shall we not tell him what we have in the car? Now you need to discern, you've got one chance, you need to discern right. You need to discern, is this man sent from God or is he sent from who? Long story short, the, the man went back, he said to him, how many books do you expect? He said, I will receive 150. And that's exactly the amount of Bibles they had in the car. They gave him the Bibles. He packed it into the donkeys, on the back of the donkeys, you know, hide it. And off he goes. Went back to the car and the car start. Um, so next time when your car breaks down, don't curse the devil. Next time your washing machine breaks down, don't curse the devil. There's no devil in your washing machine. There's no devil under, uh, in the car. Uh, have a look and see why am I here and who is close by. God can have appointment with me. I think sometimes we in the Western world, we blame everything on the devil. In the meantime, God misses out on an opportunity to do a miracle. Now, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to have a look at what, what does power look like. And in church, I feel like uh, my mandate, my mandate in, in the next few years will be to prepare the church uh, for something greater. That is why I have this incredible passion to bring all the movers and the shakers of all these nations together. And uh, I, I want to tell you what, I'm kind of nervous because I announced it and now I need to make it happen. I cannot make it happen. Only the Holy Spirit can make it happen. And, and, and if, if ever the church will have to help us financially, now is the time. So um, if you have the money, uh, we can take up a second offering. We're not afraid of that. So <laughs> if, you if you feel like the Lord wants you to give something else, just wave your hand and we'll stop right in the middle of the sermon. Is that okay, Pastor? Amen. Now, um, let's go to the book of Acts. Uh, because the two stories I told you is book of Acts stories. Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, you shall receive power. He said the power will go to the ends of the earth. When you go to chapter 2, you see the first outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You read about thunder. You read about fire. You read about other tongues. You read uh, that the people were amazed and perplexed. Um, and uh, some thought it's wine. Uh, and then they found out that this was prophet by the, pro prophesied by the prophet Joel. You will see that there were many, many nations in chapter 2, and there were even Arabs in chapter 2. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus said, you shall receive power, he already saw chapter 2. He even saw this night in One Life Church. Come on. God knows everything. Everything. He's a prophet. Where does prophets come from? That's one of the fivefold gifts that comes out of Christ. You will find the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, the evangelist in Christ. Uh, we are just uh, an expression of what comes out of Christ. That's why it's not my ministry. It's God that ministers through me. Now, 
We also said that there is not a chapter 2 for the, for the Church of God and for the Assemblies of God and for the Roman Catholics and the Presbyterians and, and, and the Rhema guys. There's only one chapter 2. There's not a chapter 2 for Chinese and a chapter 2 for whites and a chapter 2 for blacks. There's only one chapter 2. That tells me that all cultures, all nations will have to come in alignment with chapter 2. Now, when you talk about power, you need to know that power has more than one face. And we need to find out that, that power has more, more than one face. But uh, power also gives you authority. And when you have authority, uh, you cannot have power without having authority. Uh, and you cannot have authority without having some kind of power. But when you have power and authority, you will find out that you have a mandate. Because a mandate is, 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 is what is your, your zone of authority. Come on. And this church has a mandate. I have a mandate. If I don't understand what's my mandate, I'm a hopeless leader. I can lead nobody. And nobody can benefit from my ministry because I don't even know myself. So that's bad. Now, so we're going to look at power, authority, and mandate. When you go to chapter 3, you will see that we find Peter there. And uh, Peter was in the upper room. He did not come out of the boardroom. The Bible is very clear. It was not a boardroom outpouring in chapter 2. It was an upper room outpouring. It was not a committee meeting. It was not a business meeting in chapter 2. It was a pure Holy Ghost outpouring. How many of you realize we need that back in the church? Amen. Are you hungry for that? Is there anybody here that's just hungry for God? Church, um, now in chapter 3, um, the Bible says it was the hour of prayer, and they brought a paralyzed man to the temple. Uh, and by the Bible says they dropped the man at the gate of the temple. They never bring him into the prayer meeting. So they brought him for money, although it, the focus was not supposed to be on money. The focus was on prayer. But then Peter shows up. Uh, one of the things you will also notice there, the man was paralyzed from his mother's womb. That tells me this man has never walked. Now many times in America and even in the Western nations, when people are born like that, then we say, well, it must be God's will that they must look like that. Church, when something goes wrong in the womb, we don't need to come in agreement with that. Come on, don't, don't agree with things that you cannot get fixed. Go back into the upper room and find out whether you could have had the authority to fix that. Because Peter came out of the upper room and Peter found the man at the gate and Peter says, No, they were never supposed to put you at the gate. They were supposed to resurrect you. Don't throw money at things that should have been resurrected. You should remember that one. It just came out of the oven of the Holy Ghost. It's still hot. <laughs> And um, so what happened here is, Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have. Peter is very clear on what he does not have, and he's very clear on what he does have. And we need to, church, it's not, it's not, it's not a shame not to have money. But it is a shame to belong to a Pentecostal church and you don't have power. Come on, church. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Uh, I, that can preach. So he said to the man, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And we will not go into the detail because there's too much there. And then it says there in verse 10, the Bible says, and the people were filled with wonder and awe. Now, we believe in the infilling of the Holy Spirit. People say, well, I'm filled with love. I'm filled with passion. I'm filled with grace. Oh, he's such a gracious person. He's filled with grace. The Bible says these people were filled with wonder and awe. Now, I told the church a story this morning what happened in Africa to explain to them wonder and awe. How many of you realize that if God resurrects a dead body tonight, say somebody died and they're there for an hour and they are dead, and God resurrect the body. This place will immediately be filled with wonder and awe. And wonder and awe will, will, will electrify this whole place. And, and anybody can preach in an atmosphere of wonder and awe. Bible says they were filled with wonder and awe. I pray that God will fill America again with wonder and awe. 
uh, with, with, with wonder and amazement. Actually, the word is amazement, not awe. Okay. Now let's go to chapter 12. In chapter 12, uh, we saw the power of God again. And when you look at chapter 9, chapter 9 is a chapter where Paul, the Apostle Paul, came to the Lord. He was a vicious man. He was a murderer. And uh, we, we see in chapter 9 how Saul... Uh, how light shone uh, and there was a suddenly now the, the, the book of Acts is full of suddenlies uh, you will find suddenlies all the time and uh, if, we, if we live in the book of Acts then we should have more suddenlies now there's a lot of suddenlies in the book of Acts and, and uh, there was a light shining uh, and, and he fell to the ground now Paul is not a faller downer uh, Paul, the temperament that he had, he was not somebody who would just fall down for anything. So, but you know, we live in a modern day where we don't want to read the book of Acts, never mind chapter 2. We don't even want to read the book of Acts to the modern day churches because we are so seeker sensitive that we are afraid that they will think they need to fall down. Don't be, don't, don't, don't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. Uh, the, book of, the book of Acts is not going to change. The, chapter 2 is not going to change. It's relevant for today. And if we don't want it, there's other people that do want it. And um, so he fell to the ground. He heard a voice. Long story short, he was blind for three days. And then you will see the Bible says the Holy Spirit talked to Ananias in a dream and showed him Paul and said to him, go to Straight Street. And then the Lord said to Paul, Paul saw Ananias coming to him. So the two men in the same city saw one another in a vision. Isn't that powerful? That's like the man in Iran who had a dream and said, go to that dirt road and wait there. You're going to get 150 books from heaven. Isn't that amazing, church? And, and it happens every day now there. Um, so, so there you have a phenomenal manifestation. But in chapter 12, and, and this is where I ended this morning, and we'll pick it up from there. In chapter 12, you will find Herod in verse 1, he killed uh, James. Verse 3 says, and, and, and when Herod noticed that the Jews are pleased, he decided, I'm going to kill Peter. Now, the Bible says in verse 5, Peter was in prison. And um, uh, Peter is in prison, and the Bible says, in constant prayer went up for him. Uh, now, look at the link. Verse 5, church praying, Peter in prison. Can you see? The two is, is connected to one another. The Bible says in one breath, the church were praying, and Peter were in prison. Make sure that you belong to a local church so that when they talk about you, they also talk about the church. Come on, there must be a link. You must belong to a family that is busy praying. Now, forgive me for taking time. You know, that lady there, she, do, she, she did the press and worship. She needs to drive an hour and a half tonight. Is that correct? two hours. She drives two hours every Sunday. She's doing the price of worship here. There she sits and she is probably the most excited because I hear her response all the time. And, uh, and uh, she needs to drive two hours tonight, but she's sitting here. I love that. That's the kind of people we need in the church. Uh, uh, church, we, we, we need to get our passion back. That, that's an inspiration. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this with you. Forgive me for taking time. In, in this, I think I've got a CD on it here. The Amplified Bible says in verse 5, And the church made prayer for Peter. In John 1, verse 1, 2, and 3, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And everything that was made was made through him. That word made in John 1, verse 1, 2, and 3, is the, it means create. And everything that was created was created. Now, this, the word made in Acts 12, verse 5, in the Amplified Bible, is also the word made. And it also is exactly the same word. It means create. So the church create a miracle in prayer to get Peter out. I want to explain it like this. A prophet prophesy, a teacher teach, a pastor pastor, but the creator creates. How many of you realize that Buddha and Muhammad may be gods, but they are not the creator? 
How many of you realize the Creator did such a great job, we don't need another one? How many of you know there will never be another one? I mean, um, maybe uh, I just preached a word that is just phenomenal. I don't even want to touch it on um, the Creator. Um, God says, although I created the whole universe, I will allow you in your prayer life to create with me. Come on. Church, that's powerful. That, that, that's, why, that's why prayer has become the Cinderella of the church. Because nobody, don't let prayer become too prominent. Because the devil know once we start to pray in the spirit like we ought to pray, we're going to start to create things in the spirit and we're going to threaten all hell out of Satan. I don't know whether you can get hell out of him, but man, I'm telling you, when you pray like that, you feel like you can. Thank you for your excitement. Now, so that's verse 5. Now, you will see in verse 6 that there were, there were uh, guards outside, inside the prison. Peter is in prison. Now, Peter was an apostle. And Peter was not only a man that walked in power and authority, but Peter had a mandate. Everybody say mandate. I'm teaching you, church. I'm not preaching. I'm teaching you. Um, the reason I do it this way is, you know, I've preached my whole life, but I feel like I want to take it portion by portion and make sure that people get it because we don't have time to waste anymore. We need to catch up with the rest of the world. And um, so the Bible says that he's in prison, he's in chains, and that is a prophetic picture of the church today. They try to put chains on the church. They try to make laws. We not say what we want to say. We cannot do what we want to do. But that's when the Holy Spirit comes in and says, Oh, Brother Joshua, don't you worry. I see you are interrogated by the police in China. The Lord says, I'm going to give them dreams and they will be interrogated by the Holy Ghost. He did not know the man is interrogated every Thursday by the police. That's the Holy Spirit. The moment you try to put a, an, an apostle, a uh, Joshua Duong from China, an apostle, the moment you try to put him in change, you set yourself up for angelic forces to show up. That's why you have so many uh, angelic uh, ministry going on in those nations. Watch verse 7. The Bible says the moment they put him under that kind of pressure, an angel showed up. Now, angels are God's messengers. Angels work under difficult situations. They, they, they operate when things are tight. My, I have been saved by angels, I would say, three times. Twice on a plane and one day in a car in a snowstorm. The Lord took the steering wheel of my car and I made it for my plane. Uh, normally I could have died. But I believe, I believe because I have a mandate upon my life, the Lord has rescued me. Amen. Now tonight I'm going to show you something about mandate because I know what some of you say. You say, well, my name is not Andre Fancel. I don't have a mandate. No, I'm going to show you something. Oh, two chapters from now, I will reveal it to you. So what happened here is the angel showed up, and the angel struck him on the side. And the angel said to him, gird yourself, tie your sandals, and uh, get your garment and follow me. So now the angel is going to get Peter out, not the Holy Spirit. Come on. It's an angel that's going to get him out. Now, church, I come out of the apostolic faith mission, and I come out of a denomination that is enriched, and, and we understand these things because we've seen it, and, and, and I wish I could tell you more about my background, but I don't have time. Uh, so the angel said to him, get your sandals, get your garment. Now, that, that for me is mind-blowing, that God, when God gets me out, he even takes care of my clothing, my sandals. Isn't that amazing? That when God delivers you, he will not allow you to leave one piece of evidence behind that can tell people, well, you have been in prison. And then the Bible says, so he went out and he followed him, and he did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought that he was seeing a vision. So here you have the Apostle, Paul, uh, the Apostle Peter in verse 9, and he's not sure what was going on with him. 
There's nothing wrong with losing control. You know, we, we live in a day where everything is under control. I mean, I go to meetings where the, they will tell me to the minute uh, what will happen now, to the minute. I mean, it's printed. You get it before the minute. There's nothing wrong with that. But please, church, sometimes we need to throw that away because uh, we cannot run the church like that. Not all the time. Not all the time. I understand it. If you have three services Sunday morning, you need to watch your time because you need to get a certain message out. But then there comes times that we need to have a night like tonight where we say, man, this is open. There's no agenda. We're going to follow the Holy Spirit. Now, and uh, so it says in verse 10, when they were past the first and the second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city. Now watch this, they. The Bible uses the word they several times. They came. So here you have Peter walking with an angel. Um, I'm not going to do teaching on angels, but when Jesus said, you shall receive power, he saw chapter 2, he saw chapter 3, chapter 9, chapter 12. Um, when Jesus said, you shall receive power, you already knew about angelic angels that will show up. It's inclusive. It's inclusive. Come on, church. When God filled me with the Holy Spirit and when I accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, I opened up my life to a whole world of power manifestation including angels and I want to say it again I was in a plane that almost flipped right over but God made us to land I was in a snowstorm that should have taken my life many slept off the road I made it I missed it it's a ditch with an inch or two but I made it I could not bring the car to a standstill and when God I got out of the car I realized in no human being can bring a car from that wall to this end to a standstill driving 60 miles an hour on ice you cannot do it, but angels can do it. Why? Because angels say, uh, I, have a, I have a command from heaven to guard your life because I need you somewhere in the future. You are my man or you are my woman. So uh, the Bible says they were past the first and the second guard post and they came to the iron gate that leads to the city which opened to them of its own accord. So now we have a city that leads, a, a, a gate that leads to the city. That's a powerful gate. That gate guards the city. So that was just not your little garden gate. That was a gate that guards a city. But the gate is open by its own accord. Gates don't open by its own accord unless it's electrifying. And unless you have an app or something that can open the gate. Those days they knew nothing about Apple. The only Apple they knew those days was the Apple of Adam and Eve. They did not understand this thing. But you know what? Watch this. Now church, there's many gates in America. There's political gates. There's economy gates. There's vicious gates. There's dangerous gates. There's Russian gates. There's, there's a lot of scandals to be revealed that's not being revealed yet. Because of a lot of gates all over the world. L let me tell you, the world is a dangerous place. But God says that I have the ability to walk with my man. And our, when you and I come to a gate that needs... How many of you believe that it's time? that some gates just open up in America. Do you know, whether you like the, the latest president or whether you like the previous president, I don't care. All I know is the last election was not a normal election. It, it, it was not a normal election. But the finger of God came and messed things really up really well. Uh, even some politicians had to admit this is not normal. And it's about time that God, come on, and there was many prophecies about this election. So, and they still try to figure out what's going on. Can I tell you why the world is so angry? Can I tell you why America is so angry? Did you see the anger on television? I mean, they are angry. They still try to figure out what's going on. They can spin until they spin into their graves. God when God answers the prayer of the church, things is going to start to happen. So don't you think it's not about a Republican and a Democratic thing. This nation belongs to the Lord. And let me say this to you. I'm speaking prophetically. This nation has a mandate. The mandate upon America is twofold. Number one, to bring the gospel into the world. 
80% of all the money that was ever given for world missions, world evangelism came out of this nation. This nation has a mandate to guard the gospel into the nations. And the, and the second reason why God is going to bless this nation is the nation of Israel. That's the mandate of America, to protect Israel. And when you protect Israel, you take care of God's business. And, and, and I want to say to you, church, that's why I really feel that we need to bring these leaders from all these nations together. Because we are just an extension uh, of what God is lately doing in America. Amen? Uh, so we are standing. You see, we sometimes think it's going to happen in a day. No. Since last year, November or whenever we had the election until now, we are in the middle of an intervention. And sometimes we think things are falling apart. Don't worry. Things is not falling apart. Where God is at work, God has angels. And gates will open up and things will be revealed that has never been revealed before. Things will come out that people will, I mean, I've never seen people, uh, do you ever, ever, ever seen a fly on a hot plate? Man, I really feel the anointing is now coming on me. I didn't share this this morning in chapter 12. Have you ever seen a fly sits on a hot plate? He cannot sit there. A fly is not that dumb. He's not going to sit on a hot plate. And I'm telling you, things is getting real hot for some people. I mean, the one day they say this, the next day they say it. They flip-flop, man, because they have no idea who's going to be the next guy, who's going to be our leader. And then they make all kinds of, oh, man, they flip-flop the last few months. And I say to myself, I don't want to be a politician. Because if you're not on God's side, you will not know what's happening with you. Amen? How many of you believe that God has everything under control in this great nation? Now, so, um, uh, they were, the, 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 the gate opened by its own court, and the Bible says, and the angel departed from him, verse 11. Verse 11 says, and when Peter had come to himself, he said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel. So now the Bible says, Peter came to himself. This is all this morning, so you guys really need to thank the guys from this morning. They've been very gracious to listen to all of this again. But I just gave them something extra now. Uh, the Bible says Peter came to himself. How do you come to yourself? Well, you first need to leave yourself. You first need to lose control. The Bible says the angel is gone. The, God withdrew the angel. Why? Because mission completed. The man of mandate is out of the prison. Come on. The man of mandate is out of the prison. And God says the angel can come back to me. I will send him on another mission somewhere else, but I've got this man out. And the Bible says, and Peter came to himself. That tells me f there was a blank situ a situation where Peter went blank. P Peter walked through, wall walked through uh, guards and past guards through the gate of the city. He was not in control, but he was aware that an angel was with him. Watch what he said. Watch what Peter said. He says, now I know for certain that the Lord, that the Lord has sent his angel, his angel. The Lord has sent his angel. It's not your angel. You cannot call him. You cannot worship him. You cannot talk to him. You cannot command him. You cannot send him. It's his angel. He has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod. Come on, church. That's awesome. That's why when I got out of my car that day, and I looked at my surroundings, I realized I could not handle that steering wheel. But I realized an angel took that steering wheel. And, I, and that's why when I was on my way from Detroit last year, I was in a very bad snowstorm uh, in a plane. And, and I, I didn't think we were going to make it. I watched the woman next to me. She's praying all the time. I was just sitting there flip-flopping. And I said, Jesus, I'm going to land today. I don't care how bad this is. But I'm going to land today because I have a mission. I have a calling. My life is not over. And we did touch down. Okay. So... Um, then we, uh, we see how Peter went back to the church. Now, the first thing that Peter did is he went back to the church that's praying. And he found, um, uh, the Bible says, and he knocked at the door, and uh, Rhoda came to the door. And because of her gladness, verse 14, she did not open the gate. So she was so overwhelmed that she did not open the gate. And she went into the church, and she said to the church, hey, guys, Peter is at the gate. Now, watch what the church do. The church said to her, you are beside yourself. 
No, the church is saying, man, you've lost it. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. Will you please bring Peter out? Bring him out, bring him out. Father, we pray, bring him out, bring him out, bring him out. Oh, come on, man, you are beside yourself. Don't you come and tell me he's at the door. But Father, we pray that you will bring him out. But don't do come and tell me he's at the door. But Father, we pray that you will bring... What am I saying to you? Next time you pray, create. And if you pray and you create, go to your door. Come on. Did you get it? Next time you pray, you make sure you create. And when you create, watch the door. How many of you believe God can come to our door before tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock? Come on, church. Why are we here? Are we here to blow hot air over one another and that's it? No. 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 I believe God's going to come to my door. I expect somebody with a check at my door. I expect a lot of money at my door. Because I want to bring the movers and shakers together of 60 nations. And when you have them in one room and the Holy Ghost come down, oh my goodness. Can you imagine what will go on in all those nations? Come on, church. We need a miracle from God. Okay. Now let's go to chapter 16. I think the guys that were here this morning is probably saying, thank God it's over. They took me to a restaurant this afternoon. That had a sauce. It's called the yum yum sauce. Man, I am having a hard time now because of that sauce. <laughs> Don't give me yum yum sauce again, brother, before I preach. You probably know where that is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Acts chapter 16, verse 22. Watch this. Then the multitude rose up together against them. Uh, can I preach more, church? I know it's getting kind of late here. Um, I have a hard time with doing 20 minutes. <sighs> That's why I'm not a pastor. I cannot do three services in one morning. I go to the potter's house in Columbus, and normally the first service is the service. The, the second service, they just need to come in, and I don't care about the parking lot. They tell me, oh, the parking lot. I said, man, forget about the parking lot. The parking lot is inside the church. Let's park right here. <laughs> okay. Some of you don't get it, but that's okay. So uh, the multitude rose up together against them, and the, ma and, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them in the prison. Verse 25, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. I mean, th th this is long after one hour. I mean, th they are now in prison, but they are still praying. <laughs> The Bible says at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them suddenly. Now watch this. Paul and Silas is in prison. Two men that has a mandate upon their life is in prison. Can you see it? Two men. Paul, Paul came to the Lord in chapter 9. Paul is going to write two-thirds of the New Testament. And if God has earmarked you to write two-thirds of the New Testament, guess what? It's going to, you, you lock up the wrong person. Don't lock up a man that has a mandate. And, and the, the modern-day church needs to understand mandate again. We don't understand mandate. And the Bible says, um, suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison was shaken. The Bible is very clear. The foundation of the prison was shaken. I don't find that the earthquake, the Bible does not record what the earthquake did to the rest of the nation. The Bible only referred to the foundation of the prison. Come on. It's almost like the Bible is saying, I've sent the earthquake to rock the very foundation where my man of mandate was sitting. How many of you believe that God can rock foundations of the very building where you work? How many of you believe that God can send a, 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 an earthquake to foundations and institutions and buildings and secret places and secret offices in America and shake it? Yeah. Come on, church. We don't pray for nothing. 
when we create in our prayer we're going to shake up things and 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 i see what's her name again prayer warrior jackie how do you say jockey jackie <laughs> She's a prayer warrior. Uh, thank you for being here. But you know what? We need to, we need to create when we pray. Uh, and the Bible says um, the doors swing open, uh, chains were loosed, and the keeper of the prison awakened from the sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposed the prisoners had fled and drew his sword, and he was about to kill himself. So now you have the guy who's supposed to take care of Paul and Silas. Now he's afraid. It's amazing. It's, uh, Paul and Silas were supposed to be in fear, but now the man who's taking care of them, uh, that he's in fear. You see, when, when, when you start to put the focus on God and start to give him praise, even in your prison, uh, things are going to change. Now, Paul called with a loud voice. Can I read verse 28 again? Paul became Pentecostal. <laughs> It's right there. Paul called with a loud voice. He became Pentecostal. It's right there. Uh, do yourself no harm. So now Paul is saying to the man, don't hurt yourself. We are still here. Now watch this. Paul did not run away. He had the opportunity to run away. He did not run away. Because Paul, you see, power is always in control. And power has authority. And when you have power and authority, you have mandate. And Paul says, don't worry, we are all here. Now watch what happened now. Um, and he brought them all out and he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So now he's asking Paul, what can I do to be saved? Immediately, he's asking Paul, hey guys, what can I do to be saved? You see, power, manifested power will bring people to you that will ask for salvation. Come on. You know, a pastor and I spoke about it on our way here. And I said to him, I said, I don't think Jesus preached as much as I preached. And I don't think Jesus went to another cathedral or another cathedral of praise or another big building every weekend. I don't think he did it my way. I don't, th I don't think he ever flew a plane. I know he did not. And, and, and maybe we need to come to a standstill and say, what does the New Testament church really look like? Come on. Ch church is not what we do in church today. Th th this is not the ultimate of church. Church is what happens after we leave. Th this is actually just the day where we come and say, hey, you will not believe me what happened Tuesday. Oh, brother, you will not believe me. I was praying Wednesday night. Oh, brother, you will not believe me what happened, man. My car broke down and I found a man that need this and this and this. And man, I prayed for him. My car started again. Oh, you will not believe me what happened Friday morning, man. That's what this is. Sunday is supposed to be a day of celebration. And we need to come in and say, man, you will not believe me. This guy came to me and he asked me, what can I do to be saved? He, you will not believe me. He asked me. Yeah. You know, the power of God is so, it's so powerful in my life that people even come to me now and they ask me, what can I do to be saved? It's right there. Book of Acts. So when Jesus said, you shall receive power, he saw chapter 16. He saw it all. That's power. Let's go to chapter 27. In chapter 27, now again, we're talking about power, authority, mandate. We're also talking about the different faces of what power looked like. We're looking at, when Jesus said you shall receive power, we're looking at the ripple effect of that statement. Because everything we share here is because of the ripple effect. This is all the ripple effect of what happened when Jesus said you shall receive power. How many of you believe that if we have a true moment of power tonight, this meeting will have a ripple effect? You did not come to this meeting to have no ripple effect. I mean, if this, if, if, why will I spend so much time in his word and coming to church and it does not have an effect on my life? I want to say to all of you, prepare yourself for a ripple effect because of tonight. Yeah, I... You can jump this high in the church and I will celebrate it. But show me what it looks like tomorrow when I'm not close by. 
Because everything that we read here is not happening in the temple. How many of you realize that many of these things that I spoke about did not happen in the temple? It's happening in everyday life. Now, in, in, in Acts chapter 27, verse 21, But after long abstinence from food, Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me, and not have sailed from Crete and in Crete, and incur this disaster and loss. I now urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. So here we have Paul, the Apostle Paul, who's going to write two-thirds of the New Testament. He's on a ship. And he said to the gentleman on the ship, you should have listened to me. We should not have sailed from Crete. So what Paul is saying is, we made a mistake. How many of you have made a mistake at least once in your life? Now, you know what I like about this is, Paul is now on a ship and he's saying to the gentleman, we made a mistake. We should not have been on the ship. But thank God. You know, sometimes we do the wrong thing and then God comes in and he turned the wrong thing into something good. He turned, he turned a bad decision into something good. Because God can do it. So they're on a ship. Now, you will notice in verse 37 that there were 276 men on this ship with Paul. Now watch what happened now. It says there, I now urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. He's now prophesying. That's, that's prophecy. Wow. He's, he's saying to them, guys, I've got good news and bad news. Number one, we're going to lose the ship. Number two, not one of you will die. That's powerful. How do you lose a ship of that size with so many people on it and nobody dies? But you lose the ship. But watch what he says. For they stood by me this night. Somebody visit him. They stood by me this night. An angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve. So Paul admits that angels operate. He says the student angel of the God to whom I belong and the God that I serve. So what he's saying is it's not my angel. It's the, the God that I serve has angels. That's what he's saying. This, one of his angels stood by me tonight. So an angel can find you in the middle of the ocean. Come on church. Isn't that powerful? Doesn't matter where you are, God can find you. We all oh, church, this, this gives me hope. God can find me 30,000 feet in the sky. I remember in the late 90s, I was flying between Johannesburg and Cape Town. And while Naomi fell asleep, we came from America. No, it was not in the late 90s. It was in the early, it was 2001, 2003. I was in the plane, and uh, the next moment the Holy Spirit is next to me, and he said to me, uh, when you land within seven days, this is going to happen. I thought, my God, how did you get into the plane? There's no, no seats open. This is high in the sky. I will not tell you what it is. I don't have time. In seven days, that miracle manifested. And I'm not talking about a headache that went away. I'm talking about big stuff. Within seven days it manifested. Where did God find me? He found me 33,000 feet in the sky. Flying over the Karoo, which is a semi-desert area, from Johannesburg to Cape Town. And he told me, wow. And that miracle still exists today. Every time I look at that miracle, I say, he told me that 34,000 feet in the sky. How many of you are ready to hear God's voice outside this building in the most obscure places? I, I, I can just sense in my spirit that, that the Lord is stirring your hearts. Um, now watch this. He says, the angel said to him, do not be, what, what is the time? Let me see here. Oh, it's almost two hours. Okay, but I got the service about 10 till, so I'm fine. <laughs> I'm watching my portion. For they stood by me this night an angel of the, Lord, the God to whom I belong and whom I serve. And the angel said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. Two things. 
Watch what the angel said to him. He said to him, number one, you will not lose the ship. Here is the reason, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. He's saying to Paul, Paul, God, God has a future appointment for you, Paul. And God said, I must come and tell you it's going to be fine. The storm will not take you out. Because the storm had all the bite in it to take them out. But because he had a Caesar appointment, the angel gave him the reason. He says, the reason God is not going to allow you to die is because you have a Caesar appointment. You must stand before Caesar. I have a future appointment for you, and I don't have anybody else that can take your position. You are my man of mandate. You have a certain voice. You have a certain authority. You have a certain knowledge. You have a certain temperament, and only you can stand before Caesar. I cannot use anybody else. I want you to stand before Caesar. So when you have a mandate with a future, no storm can take you out. But watch what he says. He says, and I have granted you all the men that sail with you. That's powerful. How many of you noticed that the angel never appeared to the 276 men? Where did the angel go to? The angel went to the one man on the ship that had a mandate. He spoke to the man that had a mandate. He did not sp spoke to 276 men. Uh, Paul spoke to them. And Paul said, you're fine. An angel spoke to me tonight. I would love to be connected to a man that has angelic visitations. Come on. And Paul said to them, because you sail with me. The Bible does not say to Paul, well, Paul, because you sail with them, I will save your life. He says, no, I will save their life because say, they sail with you. Make careful who you sail with. Be careful who you connect yourself to. Don't connect yourself to anybody that just quote a scripture here and there. Make sure you are connected to somebody, a leader, or a couple of leaders, or a church that has heard from heaven, that has a mandate from God. Because if you sell with them, you can benefit from what comes over their life. The 276 men, were got the, they, they, they had their life in their hands because of Paul. Because the angel said, Paul, and I have granted you, I have granted you the life of 276 men. I give you their lives too. That's why church, um, in my own life, I, I, I'm not better than anybody else. Really, I'm not better. I, I check myself every day and, and, and I always pray things like, Lord, I love the church. I love the whole body of Christ. Lord, I bless that brother. Or Lord, I bless that brother. But then I know this brother doesn't believe in the Holy Ghost. This brother is not open for the move of the Holy Spirit. But I still bless them. But when I connect me, myself, I don't connect myself there. I connect myself to the, the Paul eyes and the Joshua Dwangs and the Luca Yegazars and the Bonnie Hueys and uh, uh, the David Thomases and... Uh, uh, and, and I connect myself to p people in London um, and, and, and other nations. I, I try to connect myself to leaders that I know they have a mandate upon their life. And if I walk with them, then I can benefit from what is on their life. And they can benefit from what is on my life. And that's why when you bring apostolic leadership together, like what I want to do, and I have done it several times now in America, something is going to happen in a meeting like that. It's no wonder a young prophet stood up and said, the police will no longer interrogate you. Yes, I want to be in meetings where that kind of mandate is upon the lives of leaders that when I am ter interrogated by the police, I have somebody who can hear the voice of God and say, you will no longer be interrogated by the police in China. Church, this is the kind of, th this, this, this is what I want to bring to you and I want to say to you, join us. Become, become, get onto the ship and sail with us. Come on. 
I'm going to say something that I'm probably not supposed to say. But I want to say it, and, and, and I hope I don't offend somebody in the meeting here. This morning, a young man, he came to me after the service, and he's here tonight. He came to me and says, Pastor, I came into the church and the Lord um, laid the number 150 on my heart. And, uh, and I talked this morning about the 150 Bibles. And so he gave $150. And he came to me after the service and he explained to me about the 150. And the Lord says, but there's one zero missing. And he said, Pastor, I will bring the rest tonight, but I'm going to give $1,500. It's not really the money that he gives, but can I tell you what he actually said to me? He actually said to me, I want to sail with this vision. I want to get on this ship. That's actually what he did. He said, I want to, I want to be on this ship. I want, to, I, want to, I want to get onto this authority because I feel like, you know, basically what he's now doing, he's sowing a seed. Is he going to get nothing? No. When they sailed with Paul, they got, their lives were rescued. And, and I, I want to say it again. It's more important than ever to connect yourself to the right leaders. Come on, church. There's too many people that start churches that should never have started a church. Ouch. Mm-hmm. I will not go further than that. There's a lot of people that start churches that came out of a split. When you split a church, you actually crucify Jesus for a second time. Because you split over his, open his body. This is his body. And when you split a church, you rip the whole body open. And you actually say, he died on the cross once, but he didn't do a good job. I'll split it again. Wow. Be careful. Don't sail with people like that. Because somewhere that thing is going to haunt you down. That thing was birthed out of the wrong spirit. And that happens a lot in America. If I found out a church came out of a split, I will never go there. I, will, I don't want to belong there. I don't want to sail with that. I want to sail with somebody that got an angelic visitation from the Lord and that, uh, that has a mandate from heaven. Come on, church. Rather don't have a church but have a mandate than having a church and you never had a mandate to start the church anyhow. Dangerous, dangerous things. And that's why you will never have authority. Because, okay, let's not go. Let's go to chapter 28. Amen? Are you excited? Is this good? Of course this is good. Okay. Now, in chapter 28, I'm almost finished. Don't worry. There's only 28 chapters. Brother, don't leave the church. Okay, you're going to go to the restroom probably? Enjoy. <laughs> This morning somebody got up. Oh man, I, I'm always afraid somebody's going to leave the building. Uh, no, please come back. Please come back, okay? <laughs> I should not have done that. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a terrible guy. Don't move. Don't move. Just sit there. Don't move. You can praise the Lord and you can react. But when you make too much movement, I'm going to highlight you, okay? Uh, some of you know me by now. You know me. That's what I do. Amen. I just knew that guy. Uh, I mean, he's older. So yeah. Okay. I understand. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Okay. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad I'm not like everybody else? You see, I can, I can only go to a church once a year because you cannot get me into a local church twice a year. You know, I will turn into, a, I will turn into something bad. Amen. So, okay. Acts chapter 28 for the second time. So the Bible says they escaped the ship. They're all rescued there. And, 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 and they came to the island and they found out that the island was called Malta. Watch, watch this, verse, verse 1. They found out. They didn't know. They just found out. Oh, this is Malta. But now watch this. Although they found out this is Malta, watch how God is now going to orchestrate a miracle. So sometimes you can land up in a place and you don't know how you got there. It's fine. As long as you have a mandate, God can even use the bad decision for a good reason. 
And the natives showed us unusual kindness and they kindled the fire and made us all welcome uh, uh, because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. So they had no food because the, uh, chapter 27 said they haven't had food for a long time. It's cold and it's rainy. So these people, I mean, they are paying the ultimate price. And when Paul gathered a few sticks to, to make a fire, a viper came out and bit him by the hand. Isn't it amazing just when uh, in the previous chapter an angel showed up and said, you will stand before Caesar, here comes a snake and a snake bite him. Isn't it amazing just when the devil here, you got a great promise from the Lord, he will always shows up and come and, come on. Next time when the devil shows up, you say to him, oh, thank you for confirming. Thank you for confirming. You heard that I will stand before Caesar, and now you want to come and bite me? Come on, Satan. I know your tricks. You heard that I will stand before Caesar, and now you want to... I, I, I don't believe this anymore, Satan. Your bite will not take me out. Because here is the snake. He bit him by the hand. Who? Paul. He bit the man with mandate. Come on. It doesn't say one of the other men were bit. It was Paul. There were snakes all over the place probably. Why was somebody else not bitten? But Paul was bitten, the man with the mandate. Come on, church. And, um, and, and when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No man, this man is a murderer. Though he escaped uh, the sea, yet justice does not allow to live. So now the natives saw that and immediately they jumped to conclusions. That's one of the giftings that human beings have. They jump to conclusions. Especially those in the church. They always jump to conclusions. Oh, you've been bitten by a snake. Oh, man, you must have sin in your life. Oh, my God, what have you done? Oh, my Lord. You, oh, why does it happen with you? I mean, it doesn't happen with me, but it happens with you all the time. My friend is back, so don't worry, okay? I told you. I'm a prophet. I knew what he was up to. <laughs> I'm teasing you. <laughs> and um, so what's this. Uh, and they said, uh, when they saw that, they said, oh, he must be a murderer. Yet um, justice does not allow him to live. But he shook off the creature into the fire and he suffered no harm. He shook off the creature into the fire and he suffered no harm. The bite of Satan will always come at the wrong time. The bite of Satan will always come at a time that you least expect it. Now watch what they said. They said, oh, he must be a murderer. Do you know that Paul was a murderer? He was a murderer in his previous life. You know, the devil will always raise up people to say something that was relevant in your life before Christ. Trying to tell you that you are still guilty of that thing. And then the people who say it does not even move in the spirit. It was just a lucky draw that they said the right thing at the wrong place. Because my mind can still go back to what I've done wrong before Christ. But it doesn't mean I'm guilty of that. No, that's all under the blood of Jesus. So don't let the devil ever remind you of something you've done wrong. Because that's what he does. And he will always do that so that he can hold you back and pull you back into your past so that you don't stand before Caesar. When you have a Caesar appointment, you don't need people in your life that's pulling you back to the past. Because the angel said to him, you've got a future appointment. The devil comes and reminds him of the past. Can you see it there? Can you see it there? The angel said, I've got a great future for you. You must stand before Caesar. But when Satan comes, he always take you back into the past. There it is. Right there. So guess what? Paul realized, my past is under the blood. I don't need to listen to this. I don't need to listen to this. So he just shook it off back into where it should come from. Now watch this. The Bible says... And, uh, and they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. Verse 6. They were expecting. 
Uh, oh man, I can preach on that forever. They were as, I had people in my early walk with the Lord when I was like a Joseph and I had all these dreams and I was doing things. Man, they were expecting. Oh, they were expecting. Oh, don't worry. He's not going to get, he's not going to last too long. Oh, they were expecting. I know. And I heard about it. I heard about it. Well, and uh, now it is 37 years I'm in ministry. Some of them died. <laughs> And I wrote about it in my book because I had to wait for them to die so that I can write about them in the book. <laughs> yeah, I did it. Yeah, I did it. How many of you realize sometimes you, wait, you need to wait for certain people that are in the way to die so that you can proclaim what needs to be proclaimed? I never want to be one of those that are such a nuisance in the body of Christ that people wait for me to die and get out of the way. May God help me that I will have a relevant heart and a relevant spirit. And that when I, especially when you get older, you know, when you get older, you think you know everything and nobody else knows anything. Amen. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about myself. Amen. But, um, okay. So they thought that he will swell up and die and uh, he will just fall down dead. And guess what? When you have a mandate, some people is going to wait for a long time. I mean, I, 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 I had people, uh, they, they, tr they did everything to bring me down. And this is a man of God. I mean, he really came against me. He went for my throat. And that man today is in his 80s. And a few things happened with him that probably made him think. But you know what is he saying to his children and his, his son-in-law? It's a little bit older than me. His daughter is younger than me. But they are married to one another. And now he's saying to their children, well, they are adults like me. And they are my, my age. And he's saying to them, you better connect with Andre Fancel. I want you to make sure that you get a hold of Andre Fancel. Because the hand of the Lord is upon him. It took him 30 plus years to come to the conclusion that the bite of Satan, and I will not swell up and die because I had a mandate and you're not going to take my mandate away from me although you tried everything to destroy my mandate guess what Paul did not swell up and die he did not swell up and die and neither will you swell up and die amen not one of you are here to swell up and die brother you're not going to swell up and die you're going to swell up because you eat too much food but I, I'm talking about the bite of Satan here amen hallelujah You all, you can swell up and not, not die. Uh, let me not go into that. It's not going to work out well here tonight. <laughs> now watch this. Watch this. I'm not finished. It says there, But after they looked for a long time, After they looked for a long time, they are watching Paul. That tells me that their eyes were on this man that was bitten by a snake. Come on. A man of mandate is always under the binoculars of the critics. The critics always watch the anointed man of God. And the Bible says after they have watched him for a long time... They changed their minds. They there. They there. They changed their minds. Do you know the most difficult thing to do is to change somebody's mind? If somebody comes and says, I have this kind of lifestyle, don't reason. Because when you go to television today in America, everything, they have panels. Panel of three, panel of five, and they always make sure that there's opposite opinions on the panel. And then they open up the discussion, and then it's one big fight. And then I come in and I say to Naomi, I had enough of this, put it off. I cannot take it anymore. Because every night they have this fight. Every night. And they, what, what do they do? They reason and nobody win. And they get weirdos and they, they, they reason with weirdos. They bring a weird guy with a weird opinion into the panel. They set themselves up for a disaster and tomorrow night they do it again. I said, what a fool. Do you know that Paul, this very Paul, in 2 Corinthians 2, 4, he went to the Corinthians and he said to the Corinthians, I did not come to you with the enticing words of man's wisdom. 
Why? Because the Corinthians were smart people and Paul realized if I'm going to try and reason with the Corinthians and Paul could reason. Paul was smart. But Paul says, no, I did not come with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but I'm coming to you, Corinthians, in the, spirit, in the demonstration of spirit and of power. So Paul discovered, and Paul said, before I reason with you, I will rather show you power, because power will convince you, and reasoning will just make you angry. Same Paul. And the Bible says they changed their minds. Why did they change their minds? When they saw power. When they saw power. Not in the temple. Power on the side of a fire that's burning with a snake that came out of it. In everyday life, where, it, where you need to make all the sticks come together, where you need to make an income, where you need to get your budget covered, where you need to get warmth for your family, right there in the middle of the marketplace, where you need to make things work, right there they saw power, and the Bible says they changed their minds. Can I tell you what? Most people think the people's going to change their minds in church. No. You are the reason in the market place to show the power of God so that people can change their minds in the marketplace and by the time they come here they've already changed their minds you say well the pastor didn't preach good enough that's why he did not come to the Lord no sir you should have lived a life next to the fireplace where you need to gather your sticks and that right there when you were bit by the snake that was an opportunity to show them who is greater in you the one that's in you is greater than he than he that is in the world and right there you would have had a conversion you would have had a salvation but you think the salvation don't don't drag the guy to the church and get him into the church and, and now he's going to get saved. No, he could have got saved next to the fire. <sighs> when they saw power, they changed their minds. There's a lot of people in America, they have weird lifestyles. They do strange things. Don't argue with them. Don't, don't even try to argue with them. Don't do it. You're just a fool. Don't waste your words. Shut up. And start to create through prayer. Amen. Start to create through prayer. And you will be amazed what will happen. So, um, amen. Are you excited? So they changed their minds. And now watch that. They said, oh, he's a God. So he went from a murderer to a God. It's right there. Read it. It's right there. They promote him from a murderer to a God within three verses. Can you see what God can do through power in the thinking of other people about you? You know, we have business cards. Well, I'm apostle this and I'm prophet this and I have this. And I, you know, in America, they tell you now, when I call the churches when I came into America the first time, they who are you? Tell us about your ministry. Then I need to tell them, well, I've resurrected three dead people and I've, uh, oh yeah, I forgot about the other one that I resurrected. And I have a mighty ministry and I am really an incredible prophet. And, and man, I am just the thing you need in your church. They want you to tell them that. And I said, man, I, don't come, I come from a culture where I don't tell you about myself. You need to find out about me. And then you need to invite me. I don't need to tell you how mighty I am, what kind of, no church. You see, we have business cards and, we have, and there's nothing wrong with a business card. I'm going to get one too. I don't have one yet, but I'm going to get one. I'm almost 65, but I'm going to get one before I am 80. I'm going to have one. Amen. I'm going to have my card. Hallelujah. And it's going to say, Apostle, Prophet, Evangelist, Teacher, Mighty Man of God. It's, I'm going to have a big card because I've got a lot of things I want to print on my card. Oh, Jesus, help me. Sometimes when I look at somebody's card, I want to run away. Once I saw his card, I, he will not get an invitation from me. Because the card will tell me, oh my Lord Jesus. You know, when I look at somebody, you know, lately you have so many apostles and prophets, you want to run away. I was on a plane one day. I need to tell you this. I was on a plane one day. I flew from Atlanta to Houston. It was July. It was very hot. It was so hot. Sitting in the plane, man is sitting, exit aisle. He's sitting at the at the 
at the window. I'm sitting window seat. I've got jeans. My shirt is hanging out. I'm hot, man. This guy's sitting there, three-piece suit, links, tie. He's, he's dressed up. And immediately when I looked at him, I said to myself, uh-huh, this is a pastor I know. So now he's on the phone, he's on the phone, and I ask him, and I say to him, Sir, well, who are you? He says, no, man, I'm just here in Atlanta. We have just ordained 300 prophets. I said, God, I find it hard to find one good prophet. He, they just ordained 300 <laughs> just the way he said it I just knew oh it's those kind of prophets again and I said man I've got a two hour flight to Houston I said oh okay I said well thank you sir close my eyes so now I'm going to sleep I don't want to talk to him I don't want to sleep either but I don't want to talk to him so I just decide shut your eyes because you cannot listen for two hours to this hot air Because he's going to give me his business card. He's going to ordain me to be a prophet before we land. And, and I don't want to be one of his prophets. <laughs> it just puts me off. I just have a problem with that. I got into Dallas, into another conference. A couple come to me. And that couple said to me, Oh, Pastor Andre, there's a prophet in Atlanta. And we, he asked us to send him $1,000. And then he will give us a word for healing. I said, What? Yeah, a thousand dollars. I said, listen here, God's going to heal you right now. I know it in my heart. I know God's going to heal you right now. I'm going to pray for you. God's going to heal you. And I don't want you to give me one cent. If you need money, I'll help you. I'll give you some money. Don't pay me for nothing. I said, because where this healing comes from, uh, that person does not ask money for it. I said, and don't you ever send somebody a dime because he's going to send you a word and a cloth that has certain oil on it. And when you put it on your hair, something's going to happen and your hair is going to grow. Don't believe that rubbish. How did I get onto that? But I'm talking about power. I'm not talking about fake news. Oh my goodness. Where did I get that from? You get a lot of fake in the church. Fake prophets and fake apostles. Okay. So the Bible says they changed their minds. And in that region was an estate of a leading citizen. And they brought the, the man Publius to him. And, and, and uh, they entertained uh, Paul. And um, the father of Publius laid sick of fever and dysentery. And Paul went in to pray for him. And the Lord healed him. And so, they, and so it was done. The rest of those on the island also came uh, with all their diseases and they were all healed. So the Bible says all the people that had diseases on the island came to Paul. He prayed for them and God healed them all. So now God healed the whole island and they were never even planned. They never planned to go to that island. So God can take a, a mission that were not, not ordained by God and turn it into something good. And let you rescue the whole island, shake it off, demonstrate power, and still stand before Caesar. Amen. Power, authority, mandate. When you have mandate. Now, we said a lot about power, authority, but mandate is the key word now to the end. Make sure that you are linked to somebody that has a mandate. Now, not everybody can do what I do, and I cannot do what everybody do. I'll tell you what, mo one of the toughest things these days, I would say, is to pastor a church. And I've got my reasons why I say that. And I've said it to him today. I say it about to every pastor. I have the greatest respect for what you do. Because there's no more respect for pastors these days. The man of God is just another guy. When I grew up, there was the greatest respect. Jesus could not do miracles because they did not honor him. Go and read it. Where there's not a culture of honor, you will never see miracles. Now, I don't want to teach on culture of honor. What is a culture? Not honor by incident. Uh, or honor one minute I honor you no you need to have a culture of honor it must be a lifestyle and when there's a culture of honor maybe I need to teach about that more where there's a culture of honor in a church there's miracles if you don't honor one another you're not going to see miracles if you don't have time for one another you're not going to see miracles it's not going to happen 
I went into Houston. Joshua Duong was sent by Paul I to Houston. Joshua Duong. He is instrumental in thousands upon thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, China, many nations. Comes, we come to Houston and we were in the hotel, in the Marriott Hotel, and I came down and I, um, we, uh, we, the people are arriving, the leaders are arriving, we have an evening service, and I walk down to just to go and eat something. I've never seen Joshua Duong, I've seen a picture of him, but I don't know, it's a big area where the people eat. And the next moment, out of the corner of my eye, I saw somebody, two leaders sitting together. I didn't even know it's two church people. And I saw the one man just pushes his chair back, and immediately he said to the man, excuse me. And he came running up to me, and he says, pasta, pasta. And he bowed before me. I says, he says, Joshua Duong, Joshua Duong. I said, oh, Joshua. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. Oh, yeah, pastor. It's so good to see you, pastor. Oh, thank you for inviting me. And he bowed before me. And he, he influences a hundred times more people than what I influence. But can you see the honor? The Friday in the Houston upper room, when I said, I want somebody to come and wash the feet of Joshua Duong. He's from China. One of the strong leaders of the biggest churches in America ran up. He says, can I wash his feet? Can I wash his feet? And he stood by me and says, I want to wash the feet of China. Oh, I want to wash the feet of China. And I said, man, this man has a large church, but he, he wants to get the opportunity to wash the feet of this man. And here comes the man from China. He influences hundreds of thousands. And I looked at this and I said, wow, it's awesome when mighty men can honor. And the one bowed before the other. In the meantime, when Joshua, I said to this one leader, I said, look at this man. I said, he worships us. He's almost like he's, he bowed before us when he talks to us. In the meantime, he influences many, much more people than what we do. Culture of honor walks hand in hand with power, authority, mandate. Amen. If somebody does not partake in the culture of honor, watch out for them. Those are the people that will let you down. And let them go and let them do their thing. The wheel will turn. Father, help us that we will get a grip on what we've heard today. And Lord, even the Sunday night, before we go out of this building, that we will just know we heard something, especially on mandate, that maybe you've never heard before. That if you sail and there's not somebody on the ship with a mandate, you could lose your life. But if you're linked to somebody that has mandate, that benefit, you will not stand before Caesar. That man will stand before Caesar. But because of his mandate, you are rescued. It helps to make sure who you sail with. Hallelujah. And there's some great men in this city. And I'm sailing with them all. They sail with me and I sail with them. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord help you to see miracles next to your fireplace. You understand that one? And may God help you to demonstrate power right where Satan bit you. And may God help you that people will change their thinking about you right where you were bitten by the snake. And before you leave your job, five o'clock in the afternoon, they will change their mind. And by the time you come back to your Sunday morning service, you will have a story to tell. Because the book of Acts is not temple driven. <laughs> the book of Acts is everywhere. Even in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> come on. 
you with me? How many of you feel the Lord has given you a chunk of revelation meat that you need to go and chew on? Father, I bless every man and woman in this building. Father, I, I just feel like, Lord Jesus, you have stirred our hearts. Even my own heart, Lord. I'm stirred by what 